Hi, I'm Steve Johnson. We're starting a video question and answer series where uh, my staff and people out there in the world can ask some questions. You can email in questions and we'll see if we can get some answers going that make for a real convenient sort of audio-visual exchange of ideas. So, here we go. Emma, I think you've got a question. Okay. Um, Steve, can you talk about tripod use and when you find it necessary to bring it out in the field, even if you're shooting in broad daylight where you don't necessarily need to have a tripod with you? Sure. Good question, Emma. Tripod use, when, where, why? <laughs> even on a small camera. The, the times I use a tripod are the times when my photographs get better, almost universally. The images get more carefully considered. The sharpness of the photographs increase. I slow down, and when I slow down, I'm more careful. The photographs just, in general, improve all the way around. There is not necessarily a logical time that I use the tripod or not. Certainly, when I've got a long exposure, when I'm having to trade off between a high ISO and greater camera steadiness, but as I said a moment ago, it's often true that even under the most pristine conditions where I might be able to get away with a handheld shot, the photographs almost always improve when I use the tripod. So I really encourage people to use a tripod in any circumstance that they can. There are some times when it's ridiculous to try and use a tripod, like if you're on a moving boat or in a flying airplane. In fact, I'd like to see somebody try and use a tripod on a flying airplane and see how, what kind of configuration that would look like. But in general, I try and really encourage people to use a tripod. On my workshops, I often don't carry one because my purpose is to be out there helping people make their photographs, not to be trying to make mine better. And I sacrifice some of the, the sturdiness and care that I might be able to exercise in my own photographs for the ability to work with people as quickly and as flexibly as possible. Steve, can you cover some tips or suggestions about shooting indoors without a flash. Um, I've come across a lot of different photographers who will shoot a wedding or events and their quality of images are just incredible. And they're shooting in pretty low light situations, handheld. Do you have any suggestions as to what to do? It's a good question, Emma. A lot of people are trying to deal with low light situations and weddings and candid portraits, all those things come into play real quick. You know, there's no piece of advice I can give people that's universal, but I always um, try to remember to do a, a few things that battle back my own desire for image quality versus my need for good exposure. And certainly boosting the ISO is one of those things that you can do. You need to boost the ISO only to the degree that allows you a sharp photograph and you need to also still make sure you continue to get good exposures by looking at the histogram. Those two things combined can make a big difference in moderating the boosted signal up with the ISO rays, but also keeping it on the histogram to still make sure you get a good exposure. Now, I'm not pretending that by amplifying the signal, it's like really raising the ISO of the camera. It really doesn't. But that signal amplification that it does in that circuit does make it for a more useful signal than it would be otherwise. I have this tendency to resist doing that because I know that it's going to add some noise and I'm always thinking about image quality as the penultimate result, but a fuzzy photograph that doesn't have much noise is not very useful. And that's usually the trade-off you're writing, where you're trying to, to get that added sensitivity or that apparent added sensitivity so you can have a, a fast enough shutter speed to be able to function, but at the same time not go to the the highest numbers that the camera circuitry might be capable of so that you get noise that's way beyond the actual added sensitivity you needed. So riding that compromise and doing a few experiments might get you down a path that's a little bit better. But again, you still have to make sure you're getting adequate exposure for the frames as well, not just boosting the ISO and hoping, but checking. Because so much of that image quality is going to be perceived by stimulating enough of the silicon to really get a good signal. When is it really necessary to change your white balance to some sort of 
custom setting because I normally just shoot in auto and I figure the camera does a good enough job but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on when to really change the white balance. That's a good question, Andy. The, a lot of people struggle with what to do about white balance, whether to do anything about it at all. And I do leave the camera on auto white balance to try and give the camera a chance to make a good guess at what the white balance is. It's very rarely actually right. The camera is not a spectrophotometer. But no matter what you do in camera, there's a degree of error involved because the camera is not a spectrophotometer. It's not taking spectral readings of the light, so you can get the color just right. There's a couple of strategies. Certainly allowing the camera to stay on auto white balance. When you bring that into RAW, then it'll come in marking it as shot. Any white balance you do in the camera will do that. And sometimes the auto white balance gets it right. You can do also do a custom white balance where you're actually photographing a white or spectrally neutral light gray and dial that into your camera and make that a custom white balance. It also won't be right most of the time, but it'll be a guide. Also coming in as shot with the raw file, so something you can use in the raw process if you want. But really what I do more than anything else is I take a photograph of a spectrally neutral gray card, either the Macbeth color checker or one of the little digital gray caps that I sell, and that gives you essentially encoded in the raw file a spectrally neutral gray that you can then decode in the raw processor by clicking the white balance tool on it and it makes that spectrally neutral gray gray in the interpretation in other words neutral in the interpretation in the raw processor and in the process in the course of doing that you have the gray being gray and you've got the color balance neutered for that lighting condition now that doesn't necessarily mean it's what you want the color to look like but at least gives you that starting point where the gray is gray and you can make a decision from there if you want to warm it up or cool it down. Um, a lot of my favorite photos look like they were spontaneously shot and I'm wondering how you can kind of get that look or not redo. I guess like I'm wondering like my favorite photographers shoot in like it seems like they just happen to come upon the scene that they're in. And I have a lot of trouble getting comfortable with my subjects or getting in that situation. So I'm wondering how as a photographer one can, you can put yourself in a situation to get that sort of spontaneous look. Andy, your question about how to make things seem either spontaneous or casual yet still have that intensity that makes it a great photograph. There's a lot of things that contribute to that, but as I tell people all the time, no matter how hard the photograph was to make, it has to look easy, even if it was really hard. Now, the things that contribute to that are very different depending on the kind of photograph that it is. If it's a portrait, almost always what will contribute to making it look both casual and intense from slightly different points of view is striking up a conversation with the person, getting to know them a little bit, finding out uh, a little bit about what it is that made you curious about photographing them to begin with. Very rarely, I think, do people make portraits clandestinely that actually turn out very compelling. So I think the, the portraiture aspect, definitely get, get a conversation going with people. I saw some kids in Maine just last week who were standing around just talking, and I just said to them, God, you guys look great, can I take a picture? They said, oh, sure, but let me put my cigarette down. So, you know, we had a portrait. It was not only consensual, which is important, but I had a little bit of a conversation with them and got a comfort level going. In terms of more formal things where there is a, um, a chance to really carefully craft the image, part of that, I think, has to do with something seen beautifully sometimes makes it seem easy because the beauty is so carefully put together. And that's kind of what I was referring to earlier, where no matter how hard it was to do, it needs to seem easy. And I think that's almost getting to that area of art where we're talking about graceful and eloquent. And we think of the greatest paintings that have ever been done. They don't look like they were hard to do. Even if you can look close and see that there's incredible craft, there's something easy about something in its basic appearance when it is an extraordinary piece of communication. 
So I think just working on that intensity of the things that you care about ultimately and bringing that craft to it can make them look easy even if sometimes they're very hard. But that's, that's at least one set of ideas to think about. So as a photographer today, there's countless websites and outlets for people to share their work. And it seems like anytime I go on Flickr or you know one of those sites, there's everyone is a fantastic photographer. So I'm wondering how, as photographers, we're supposed to approach that huge community of talent and, I don't know, be unique. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of good questions today. <laughs> and that's a good one, Andy. I remember going into a retrospective show on Ansel Adams at the De Young Museum in Golden Gate Park, and it was a parade of all of these wonderful, wonderful photographs. And I remember feeling similarly to what you were just talking about, about looking at really nice photographs out on Flickr or the Internet. And as I walked through that museum and I continued to be amazed and impressed at the amount of work that had been poured into it and sort of the icons of photographic history in some ways that had been created, you get discouraged at some level because you can't help but think, how can I ever be good enough to even be in this arena? But then by the same token, I continued to walk through that exhibit that day and realized that there are things that I would have done different than I saw this photographic hero of mine, Ansel, doing. And I realized that ultimately I was more interested in the photographs that were going to come out of what I saw and what I reacted to than I was discouraged by other people's beautiful work. It became sort of a a fashion nation with what was photographically possible in trying to read other people's work for the inspiration that it carried rather than feeling the weight of the fact that it seems impossible to ever be as good as all these other people. And I'm not kidding when I said Ansel Adams was a, was a photographic hero of mine. And it really didn't matter that I got to know him and got to know him as a person a little bit as well. What mattered in that exhibit, this was after he'd passed away, was that sense of being overwhelmed by the majesty of all this work, initially feeling that exact same discouragement you're talking about, and then by the end of that experience actually walking out of there feeling empowered because he did things a way that pleased him and was within his reach technologically at the time. And I do things differently, I see things differently and ultimately trying to figure out what it is I wanted to show people is inevitably going to be intrinsically more satisfying to me than what other people decide to show to other people. And I think gaining that confidence that in your heart and in your mind and in your interaction with the world there is something that is unique and continuing to work to find that voice is what's going to be the only thing that's going to be satisfying to you. And ultimately, that's where the work will really have a meaning. And so if you can use the, um, the diversity and depth and impressive array of photographs that, you, that we now have access to on the Internet as inspiration for other people finding their voice rather than being discouraged by it, I think that's the greatest power of this new level of sharing that we now can um, access. One thing I might add to that last answer is the single most important way to react to other photographs that really move you and make you think that uh, they're, they're just something that you really care about and are inspired by is let that be the kick in the butt to go out and work some more. Because in, in the long run, out there producing the images is what's going to develop and strengthen whatever style inclinations you have. And at the same time, working, 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 and working is going to force you to be a better and better communicator, uh, translator, if you will, from that inspiration to pick up to the cam pick up the camera, to being able to move people emotionally with the result of that photographic work. So where that inspiration seems deep and kind of overwhelming, let it try and be that incentive to go out there and work your ass off. Uh, Steve, you know I've taken some of your workshops and I've really enjoyed them. But one thing I noticed that you have a real ability to do is see slight changes or differences in color that you can tell need to be made correct 
as far as making the final print. Is there a way to develop more of those skills to, uh, you know, be able to see that and make those corrections? Well, Carl, that's a, a question I get from people once in a while. How do you how do you learn to distinguish small differences in color? Some of that just comes with time, of those long, long days in the darkroom working toward a color pack and a test strip where you're you're looking at nuances of color change and tracing it through and trying to understand how much of a move it takes to create a particular effect. So there's no substitute for time and experience on color judgment. There is also um, a learning curve with regards to learning how to express in words and therefore sometimes translate into Photoshop dialog boxes. But one of the things that I often do is I tell people to pick up one of these old Kodak color print viewing filter kits, which is what we used in the darkroom. And they have in them cyan, magenta, yellow filters that you can hold in front of your eye and look at the print and you can see what a color shift will take that print toward. And then the more you do that, the more you start to build up a visual intuition about color balance. And that, I think, is, is the trick. To, to have an aid where you can, but just keep asking it of yourself and then looking at the results. If a print, if there's something not quite right about the flesh tone, usually you've got to ask yourself, is the flesh tone looking green or magenta? Because it's usually one of those two things, polluting the red. If the sky doesn't look right, it's often that there's too much royal blue, which is really what we, what a spectral blue looks like, and you need to move that, that hue toward the cyan a little bit. Dirt and skin are almost the same color. It's just a question of lightness. And they're both riding that sort of magenta green axis, being opposites on the color wheel, being subject to the magenta and green filters in here to see what a little bit less green would look like by adding a little magenta or what a little bit more green would look like by adding a little more green. I mean, it sort of goes along that path. The other thing is that... Uh, we do have a routine in, or we did have in Photoshop a routine called variations that allowed you to build what was kind of a virtual color ring around like we used to do in the darkroom, where you'd have nuances of color added around the, the core uh, initial color balance and that could sometimes give you an idea. So if you go to Photoshop CS4 or earlier, variations will be in there under the adjustments uh, editors, not as an adjustment layer, and the photograph has to be an 8-bit, and then you can use that as a preview entity as well. But it's just doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and doing it that builds those color judgments. And, um, <clears throat> and talking about it helps, too.